I would just like to make a few remarks and then to talk about whatever you'd like to talk about. And, uh, and in looking at the uh, Irish-American relationship, uh, before we get into the, the myths, I'd like to just talk about some of the realities that uh, we all know and that we all agree on. The first is that for a small country, Ireland has an unusually high level of access uh, politically in Washington. This is something that anybody from any other uh, embassy in Washington tends to observe immediately. Uh, it starts with the fact that we're the only country that actually has a fixed appointment with the President of the United States every year, which is on the 17th of March and St. Patrick's Day. And uh, if you look, to, say, this year at the length of time on that single day that uh, the Taoiseach Brian Cowan spent with Barack Obama, that fake time, starting with their meeting in the morning, their bilateral meeting, the shamrock ceremony, then lunch uh, on Capitol Hill uh, with the speaker and with uh, everybody else, and then back in the White House later for a reception. It's an unusually uh, lengthy uh, period to spend within a few weeks of Obama taking office. But this is something that's there. And also, at the same uh, time, access on Capitol Hill is uh, extraordinarily good. And, the, and this is something that obviously the Irish Embassy works, uh, successive Irish embassies have worked very hard to maintain. But then we get on to why that is. And again, I think we probably most of us agree that uh, the reason for uh, this level of access is to do with Irish America. And this is where the questions start. And, uh, and it seems to me that there are two competing myths circulating right now about Irish America and the Irish American relationship. One, uh, the traditional one, uh, the traditional view of Irish America, uh, which I think is a myth, is that uh, it's a political block. And so that there is such a thing as an Irish American vote that can be swung one way or another uh, primarily through Irish issues. So that, for example, an administration or a candidate taking a particular policy on Northern Ireland or on immigration, that this actually will move a huge block of people. And uh, the other one, uh, the other competing myth is that, in fact, there's no such thing as Irish America politically at all. And this is uh, recently in vogue uh, in the United States. Trina Vargo, who runs the US-Ireland Alliance, she's uh, spoken and written quite a lot about this, as of various others. And basically her view, and the view of many others, is that actually uh, the, the, that Ireland has an old-fashioned and antiquated view of what Irish America is, that uh, we <coughs> depend far too much on shamrocks and shillelaghs and on uh, old, uh, an old idea of what Ireland is, and that the people uh, who are usually identified as leaders of Irish America are out of touch not only with Ireland but with Irish America. And so under this view, what we ought to do is to present ourselves much more as a normal any other European country and focus on things like high tech and on culture and on all the rest. Now, it seems to me that, in fact, the truth lies somewhere else. And that is that uh, Irish America, uh, first of all, there's the facts of it, that 36 million people uh, identify themselves as Irish Americans. That's 12% of the American population. Uh, more people actually identify themselves as German Americans. And this is, it's an important statistic because you actually have to uh, choose. You, can, you don't have to, in the census, call yourself any hyphenated American. You can also just choose to call yourself an American. So it's a choice that people make uh, to identify themselves in this way. And if you look at uh, the most recent uh, presidential election campaign, I think you can see the way in which Irish America works politically. Uh, two candidates particularly, Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side and John McCain on the Republican side, identified Irish America as an important source not only of funds, and Hillary Clinton particularly had a very, very effective network of Irish American fundraisers led by Declan Kelly, who's now curiously enough, the uh, economic, uh, economic envoy for, uh, to Northern Ireland. And uh, he, uh, he, with uh, various others, uh, he introduced a whole new generation of Irish American fundraisers and raised millions upon millions of dollars for her campaign. Likewise, John McCain, when John McCain's campaign, as you may recall, he was initially the front runner and then his campaign died in the summer of 2008. It appeared to be completely over. And among the few groups of activists and supporters that stayed with him were this group of Irish American Republicans. And uh, what both of those candidates found was that, they, that by tapping into Irish America, not only could they get money, but they could get 
a whole cultural and social network of organizers, of activists. If you wanted to have an event in Canton or in some uh, small uh, or moderately sized city in the middle of America, you could immediately, through this Irish American network, you could get access to people who would organize for you. And also, because of the demographic, because many of them are Catholics, for example, many of them are swing voters, and they're also, as a group, voters who are more inclined than many other groups to vote. And so they're useful. And, uh, and rather in the way that, say, um, APAC operates on behalf of, uh, of Israeli policy in America. If you're a candidate uh, and you, uh, you know, you're approached by a group like APAC or indeed by Irish American organizers, you have to concern yourself not only with the fact that if you don't get their money, that you won't have that money, but you also have to think about the fact that your opponent very possibly will. And we're seeing this happening now, for example, uh, in New Jersey, where the gubernatorial election is between John Corzine, the Democrat, uh, the incumbent, and uh, Chris Christie, who is Irish-American, an Irish-American Republican who has, who is also a former prosecutor, and he has got very good links with Irish-Americans in that whole law enforcement world. And he's uh, attracted an awful lot of Irish-American Democrats who have crossed over to him and are fundraising and are supporting him. So uh, in the case of both Hillary Clinton and John McCain, they uh, approach this in a traditional way. Barack Obama was an interesting case because he was defining his candidacy initially in opposition to the Clinton Democratic machine. And he chose initially not to organize on the basis of uh, ethnic groups because he wanted to oppose this policy, as he called it, of slicing and dicing the electorate and setting them up in opposition to one another. And so, for example, uh, there's this uh, Irish-American forum which happens every election, has done for the last uh, decade or two. And uh, Hillary Clinton spoke to it and McCain spoke to it, and Obama didn't. But then something happened later in the campaign after he, uh, you know, he did get, uh, have a few Irish Americans for Obama, a fairly small group operating, raising money and organizing for him. But it was only when he clinched the nomination that he really took an interest. And so what he did was that uh, some of his advisors produced on the eve of the Democratic Convention in Denver in, in August of 08, uh, they produced this policy paper on Ireland and on Irish America. And this hit a number of issues. One was uh, Northern Ireland, another was immigration, there were various others. And it was quite an interesting and radical document because, for example, he said that uh, he called into question the whole business of whether we needed a special envoy for Northern Ireland and basically said that uh, you know, now that the uh, conflict uh, in Northern Ireland had moved to a point where it was really about the, the parties themselves doing things and that the role of the United States might be one that where we would be inclined to step back. Well, as soon as, he, as this was published, there was a storm within Irish America and among Irish American Democrats. And within 48 hours, Obama had appointed what he called this green team of people like the governor of Maryland, Martin O'Malley, Richie Neal, who's the uh, Democratic congressman from Massachusetts, who's the chair of the Congressional Friends of Ireland. Basically, all of the old, uh, reliable Irish Americans who then uh, were set up as, being, as advising him on uh, all these Irish questions. And they started to backtrack on uh, this whole issue of uh, the envoy. Now, as we know, what has happened since he, uh, he got into office is that uh, there is no uh, envoy. Uh, there's an economic envoy, but there's no special envoy for various reasons. Uh, but in recent weeks, as Hillary Clinton has maintained uh, the role of the chief White House person on Northern Ireland and on Irish affairs, groups the, uh, closer to Obama within the White House have now started to move, from what I'm told, to start to reclaim some of this territory. And so they've now uh, decided to take an interest in it. So I think that Obama has uh, recognized, uh, and the people around him, that actually if you cede this particular political territory, that you actually could be ceding something that could be useful to you in the future. So, um, so this then begs the question as to what uh, we ought to do about it, how we should uh, promote uh, the relationship using what we have. 
And I think that uh, the documents that the Department of Foreign Affairs and the American, uh, the Irish Ambassadors of the United States uh, published recently is actually a good uh, template in that uh, what we have to do is, first of all, don't throw out the shamrocks and shillelaghs. If people want, like their shamrocks, then give them their shamrocks. There's absolutely no uh, harm. There's no loss in that. Because it is because uh, the shamrocks and all the rest of it, they do speak of a particular kind of cultural attachment, which is real to the people involved, even if it's unfamiliar to us. It's actually, uh, there is such a thing as Irish-American culture, and that's something that which is distinct but connected to uh, distinct from but connected to Irish culture, indigenous Irish culture. And so I think that, uh, first of all, you do preserve what we have. And then you look on how you can build on it. And one of the things they've been looking at is how we can give back. Because, uh, again, from it's clear to, to all of us that we probably get rather a lot more out of the relationship, uh, the Irish-American relationship, than the Americans do, at least on an official level. And so how can we... Uh, say to Americans and to Irish Americans that we appreciate what they're doing. Now, the traditional American way is that you honor them somehow. You thank them for their service and you honor them for their leadership and you do uh, all of these things. And then after you've done that, you say, by the way, there's this little issue that we might want to talk about, about tax. And, uh, and so you get in on that. But I mean, it's, but certainly they're looking at, for example, this idea of some way of acknowledging a connection with Ireland through uh, this certificate of Irish ancestry. And this is something which uh, it doesn't actually give you uh, a, a sort of fast track to Irish citizenship or indeed anything much. They're talking about maybe you'd be able to go through a different queue in the uh, passport control or something. But, uh, but certainly it's something that probably uh, Irish Americans would appreciate. But I would say that, uh, that before we just go on and talk about uh, the rest of it, I think certainly that uh, there's an opportunity also now with the new Obama administration, which is uh, an administration that embraces multilateralism, that embraces the uh, idea of operating through multilateral institutions. And so there's a moment here where uh, really uh, our policies, uh, our, our national foreign policy and the US foreign policy is probably closer than it has been for, uh, for some years. And here, uh, we can possibly use our relationship with the United States to their advantage in terms of their relationship with Europe, but also obviously to ours. Uh, anyway, uh, beyond that, I'd like to maybe just talk about whatever anybody else would like to discuss.